If you look at India's tech landscape um, over the last few decades, one thing is just strikingly clear, dependence. Mm -hmm. For years, India has relied on places like Taiwan, China, Korea, Vietnam for, mm. well, for the chips that power basically everything we use. Everything, from your smartphone to the EVs on the road. And that reliance, it creates a massive strategic vulnerability. Especially with the growth we're seeing. Oh, absolutely. The growth is explosive. The market was already, what, around $34 billion in 2023? Which is already huge. Right. But the forecasts say it's going to triple. We're talking well over $100 billion by 2032. That's because of this soaring domestic demand for you know wearables, data centers, all the automotive tech. That's an incredible curve. And it means that this idea of chip sovereignty, it's, uh, it's not just a political talking point. It's a critical strategic necessity. It's about future economic stability. So India's response is equally massive. The India Semiconductor Mission, or ISM, and they launched it with a just a phenomenal $10 billion commitment, ISM 1.0. And that $10 billion, that's just the foundation. We're already hearing proposals for an ISM 2.0, maybe doubling that to $20 billion to really scale up and compete globally. So the mission is clear. It is. To shift India from being almost entirely a chip importer to a self-reliant global player in manufacturing. Okay, so let's unpack this. We have this huge investment, this audacious goal. Our mission for this deep dive is to break down the actual blueprint. How are they structuring a shift this massive? We're going to dive into the four key policy schemes and then the 10 specific groundbreaking projects that are now underway. And the strategy is really uh, quite systematic. It targets every single part of the semiconductor value chain all at once. Design, fabrication, packaging, even the displays. So let's start with the biggest piece of the pie, the most capital intensive part. That would be scheme A, the semiconductor fab scheme. Yeah. This is the core. It's all about building the large scale wafer fabrication plants, the fabs where the chips are actually made. These are the billion dollar facilities. Exactly. And so the incentive is massive too, up to 50% fiscal support from the government. The goal here is to establish advanced fabs that can serve India's huge domestic needs, but also compete on the world stage. That makes sense. It's the manufacturing heart. But, you know, making a chip isn't just about etching silicon. What happens after it's made? Right. If the fab is the kitchen where the cake is baked, you still need a high-tech facility to sort of test it, package it, and make sure it's ready for the consumer. And that's the next scheme. That brings us to scheme B, the compound semiconductors and ATMPS scheme. Okay, can you just quickly break down those acronyms? ATMP and OSAT, we hear them all the time. Absolutely. So ATMP is assembly, test, mark, and package. And OSAT is just outsourced semiconductor assembly and test. Think of them as the high-precision finishing facilities. So they test the chip, cut it out of the wafer, and put it in its protective shell. Precisely. And without that capacity at home, India would still have to ship its chips abroad for those final critical steps. This scheme also supports advanced materials beyond pure silicon and specialized things like MEM sensors. Got it. So packaging and testing are key for supply chain resilience. What about scheme C? You mentioned displays earlier. That's the display fab scheme. Again, a big 50% financial assistance package. But this one is targeted squarely at setting up manufacturing for AMOLED and LCD technology. Screens, a huge import for India. A huge import bill, yeah. Self-reliance in displays is critical for the whole electronics manufacturing ecosystem, smartphones, TVs, everything. Okay, so we have the factories, the packaging, the screens, but all of that is kind of useless without the intellectual property, without the design. And that's Scheme D, the Design Linked Incentive, or DLI scheme. This one targets the very top of the value chain, innovation. Tapping into India's engineering talent pool. Exactly. It gives financial support and design infrastructure to startups that are developing their own ICs, their own systems on chips, their own IP. The DLI scheme is all about empowering the next generation of Indian chip innovators. So that's the blueprint. Four schemes, full life cycle. Now let's look at the cornerstone, the actual projects. And there's one that really stands out as the foundation for this whole dream. We're talking front-end manufacturing now. This is Project One, the big partnership between Tata Electronics, 
and Taiwan's power chip. Yeah. They're setting up in Dolora, Gujarat. And this is it. This is officially India's first pure play semiconductor fab. It's the tangible symbol of India finally entering chip manufacturing. And his specs are really pragmatic, very strategic. It's using established 300 millimeter wafer technology, and it's making chips in the uh, 28 to 90 nanometer range. Okay, so not the absolute cutting edge three nanometer chips in the latest iPhones. No, but these are the workhorses. The chips you need for power management, microcontrollers, display drivers, the logic needed for everything from washing machines to EVs. It's focusing on volume and what the country actually needs first. What's the scale and the timeline look like? The facility is planning a capacity of 50,000 wafers a month. And the key date, India's first domestically produced chip from this plant is expected to roll out by 2026. Wow. So this single project basically validates the whole commitment. It really does. Okay, so that's the foundation. Now, the other nine projects, they fall mostly under that ATM posts and compound semi-scheme, the packaging and testing engine. Right. And while these are less capital intensive than a fab, they're much quicker to get up and running. And the partnerships here really show that global confidence we talked about. Let's start back in Gujarat, which is clearly becoming the main hub for this. It is. Ooh. Project 2 is a big one. Micron Technology from the U.S. Right. Micron's building a state-of-the-art ATMP facility in Sanand, inside a special economic zone. They're focusing on assembling and testing DGRAM and NAND memory modules. So the storage that goes into every phone and server? The very same. And phase one includes a half million square foot clean room. It's huge. It puts India firmly on the map for global memory production. And right next door, also in Sanan, there's another one, Project 3, a triple collaboration. A powerful one, yeah. You've got CG Power, Japan's Renesis Electronics, and Star's Microelectronics from Thailand. This is an OSET facility specializing in analog, power, and mixed signal packaging. And it leverages Renesis' expertise in automotive chips, right? Exactly. Yeah. Which is perfect for the growing domestic EV and industrial sectors. They're doing advanced packaging like QFN, SOIC, and FCBGA. And there's even more in Sanand, Project 4, Kane Semicon. They seem to be focused on something more future-proof. They are. But before we get to Kane's, it's worth asking why everyone is clustering in Gujarat, Tata, Micron, Renesis. It's a good question. The sources suggest it's a perfect storm of consistent policy, fast land allocation, and existing industrial infrastructure. That kind of concentration helps build a skilled labor ecosystem much, much faster. That makes perfect sense. The supply chain needs that geographic density. Okay, so let's talk about the future tech with Keynes Semicon. Keynes is focusing on next generation packeting. We're talking 2.5D and 3D integration and something called chiplet based architectures. Chiplets. That's the new frontier in processor design, isn't it? It really is. Instead of building one massive complex chip, you build smaller, specialized functional blocks the chiplets, and you stack them or place them side by side using these advanced techniques. And that's crucial for things like AI and high-performance computing. It's arguably the only way to manage the power and heat requirements for those high-end systems going forward. It's a huge leap in ambition for India. Okay, let's move beyond Gujarat now, north to Uttar Pradesh. Project 5 is setting up near the new Noida International Airport. That's the team up between HCL and Taiwan's Foxconn in Jewar. This is an OSAT unit completely dedicated to making display driver ICs. The chips that control every screen in your phone, your laptop, your car. Precisely. They're planning a capacity of 20,000 wafers a month, which is a direct shot at reducing that display component import bill. And then there's a really significant expansion into a new region. Project 6 is in the northeast. This is Tata Semiconductor Assembly and Test, or TSAT. They're building India's first major greenfield ATMP facility in Moragaon, Assam. And that's significant for a few reasons. It is. First, it brings high-tech manufacturing to the Northeast, which is a big deal for inclusive growth. But second is just the sheer scale. They're projecting a capacity to process an incredible 48 million chips per day. 48 million? A day. Per day. Serving automotive, 5G telecom, and consumer devices. That is just immense. And setting up something that high-tech in a greenfield region must have huge logistical challenges, I'm thinking, power skilled labor. The sources acknowledge that for sure. But the strategy seems to be heavy investment in local upskilling and infrastructure redundancy. And when a major player like Tata commits like this, it suggests they're tackling those risks head-on, backed by government incentives. It's a statement. It's about setting a precedent. 
It is. All right, let's shift focus to specialized materials. This is where India is really diving into next-gen components for things like the EV revolution. We head to Odisha's Info Valley. Project 7 is 6M Private Limited, partnering with the UK's classic wafer fab. This is said to be India's first commercial compound semiconductor fab for silicon carbide, or 6A devices. And 6 is so important for power efficiency, right? Especially in cars. Precisely. 6 handles power and heat way better than regular silicon. It's essential for EV inverters, fast chargers, renewable energy grids. This facility will produce 60,000 6E wafers a year putting India in a very select group of nations that can make these critical power components. And there's another one in Odisha, Project 8, that's even more futuristic. This one is 3D glass solutions from the U.S. They're setting up an advanced packaging facility that uses embedded glass substrates. Glass substrates, so like a microscopic glass platform to connect the chiplets? That's a great way to put it. They specialize in something called 3D heterogeneous integration. It's absolutely cutting-edge stuff for boosting performance in AI, HPC, and RF applications. It shows a commitment to the highest end of integration. We're almost there. Just two projects left. Project 9 takes us to Punjab. That's Continental Device India LTD, or CDIL. They're expanding their existing unit in Mahali. It's a brownfield expansion, focusing on high-powered discrete devices like MOSFETs and IGBTs. Using both standard silicon and that critical silicon carbide. Right. And that modernization is crucial for securing components for EV powertrains and 5G, 6G communication systems. And finally, Project 10 wraps things up in Andhra Pradesh. This is ASIP T Technologies, working with South Korea's APAS T. It's another high tech ATMP facility, but it's centered on system and package, or SIP technology. SIPPP. That's putting multiple different ships into a single module, right? A processor, memory sensors all in one compact package. It makes devices smaller, smarter, more efficient. With an annual capacity of 96 million units, this plant is aimed right at the high volume demand from smartphones and IoT devices. You know, if we zoom out and look at all 10 of these, what really stands out is just the, the sheer breadth of international partnerships. The US, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, the UK, it's not just an internal project. And that global participation, that's a huge vote of confidence. It shows the world sees India not just as a consumer anymore, but as a critical future manufacturing hub. And these projects, they translate directly into high-value jobs, technology yeah. transfer. And, you know, just more domestic control over strategic sectors, from mm -hmm. the chip in your car to the module in the nearest 5G tower. So to just quickly recap the incredible scope here, we've gone from the massive foundation, that single 28 nanometer fab in Gujarat, all the way to highly specialized materials like silicon carbide and duja, and then to truly massive high volume packaging, like the 48 million chips a day planned for Assam. The complexity and the speed are just staggering. Yeah. This isn't just about replicating old, simple supply chains. It's about jumping directly into next generation tech like 3D integration and sick and power electronics. It's a full spectrum approach. Which brings us to the final question for you, the listener. With this blend of huge domestic demand and a major push into advanced specialized electronics, will this initial $10 million investment simply allow India to serve its own massive internal needs? Or will this initiative quickly make India the competitive, indispensable, high-tech hub that the $100 billion market projection suggests fundamentally reshaping the global supply chain over the next decade? That is the deep dive for you to consider.